Okay, we'd like to welcome you to another uh, great episode, and we have some questions that we're going to be answering today. And Father Trujillo, why don't you outline those questions for us? Okay, our first question today will be, what happens when the Pope dies? Yeah, what does happen? It's well, a, they plan a funeral, I know yeah, that. I, I would imagine. <laughs> okay, another question we're going to look at is, is it ever okay to, to tell a lie? Well, what did our parents tell us? No fibs. Our third question, can the seal of confession ever be broken? Hmm. That's something that's very timely today. It's being challenged yeah, all yeah, over yeah. by courts. That's right. And last, how many times can the faithful receive Holy Communion on the same day? All these questions will be answered in this episode, so stay tuned. Regina Celi, Pletare, Alleluia. We Hello, welcome to another special edition of Web of Faith 2.1 and a half here at Studio 1A at the Potsy Network <laughs> here in Flemington, New Jersey. And uh, this show, of course, is based on our EWTN show, which airs on Saturdays at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My name is Father Kenneth Briganti, and for those who are are viewing outside of our parish on our YouTube site. I am the pastor here at St. Magdalene's in Flemington, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague. I can't you're going to say we're running for office. Yes, my name is Father John Tregilio, the Diocese of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Director of Pastoral Formation at Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And obviously, he's in quarantine too, so they're doing their seminary classes by Skype or Zoom. Skype, Zoom, you name it, we're doing and Canvas. Right. <laughs> and Canvas too. Uh, and um, so t we have some questions here today written in, and quite a few came in over the weekend. We're taping this show on Monday. You'll probably uh, view this tomorrow on Tuesday. Uh, so please continue to send those questions in, and we're going to be able to answer them during this week uh, of taping. So uh, the first question is for you, Father John. Okay, I'm ready. Father John, uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for all your words of wisdom on your homilies. Uh, especially enjoy your fervor. My question is, what happens when a pope dies? How is he replaced? Hillary from Schenectady. Ah, Schenectady. Almost near my uh, woods. Uh, I'm originally from Erie, Pennsylvania, even though it's many miles. But we Didn't you used to have a limerick there. about Erie? <laughs> Erie, Erie, mistake. Dreary, Erie, the mistake on the, the lake. lake. That's at it. Misery <laughs> Bay. At Misery Bay. There you go. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, when the Pope dies, there's an ancient custom. They take a little tiny silver um, hammer, and they very gently wrap it on the Pope's forehead and call him by his baptismal name three times. And if he doesn't respond, then he's declared dead. Now, it's not a medical <laughs> proclamation. It's just an ancient custom. Uh, and I don't even know if they still did that when uh, John Paul died, but that was a little bit of Catholic esoterica. But once the Pope's been declared dead by um, the, the valid civil authorities there, they summon all the cardinals of the world who are of voting age. And that means any cardinal is up to the age of 80 can, can vote. And... Previously, the problem was a lot of like in the United States, if you saw the movie The Cardinal, uh, it took a long time to get over there because they didn't fly by plane. They had to take a boat. And by the time the ship got there, the conclave was over. So now they give them about 21 days, uh, if not a month, to travel from all over the world. All the voting eligible cardinals come. And they have nine days of masses for the deceased pope, the Novum Diem. And uh, that's to, you know, give great honor, but also to pray for his soul. And he lies in state, and then there's the, the official um, <clears throat> Vatican funeral for him. And I don't know if you remember, when Pope John Paul the Great died, 
That was the largest attendance of any yes. funeral in the world. Every head of state you can imagine was there. Uh, presidents, our president was there. Uh, prime ministers, kings, queens, earls, uh, Saudi sheiks. It was unbelievable. And it was a testimony to how well loved uh, well, John Paul the Great was. Then after the funeral was over with, they seal up the cardinals in the Sistine Chapel. There's a person that's sort of in charge. What, he has a very interesting name. Yeah, it's called the Camarnengo. And um, the last Because it comes from the word room, camera. Yeah, there's a room. And it's called a conclave because they lock the door. Conclave. Conclave. With key. They lock the door. And um, they, 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 the Monsignor um, Marini, uh, at that time when Pope John Paul died, said, um, everybody go out. And they left... Uh, only the cardinals are allowed in there. Now, they stay in the Domus uh, Sancta Marta, where Pope Francis lives now. Previously, that was just a hotel used when the Pope uh, died, and they had the cardinals come for the conclave. And then in between, uh, because Pope John Paul reigned for 26 years, they used a hotel uh, also for regular business. In fact, Father Brigetti and I and the Confraternity Catholic Clergy used it back in 2010. And we were given special instructions not to drop <laughs> any wine on the marble floor. Because uh, Monsignor Aldo, that they affectionately... The, the, Aldo uh, Cello? Aldo Cello, the the, uh, the uh, Aussies affectionately called him Il Duce. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> for those anyway. of you who are young, Il Duce was Mussolini. Yes. That's a name for Mussolini. Recall. Anyway, when the, they have the, the official voting... The cardinals are all there uh, in, in the Sistine Chapel, and they basically have two ballots every day, and uh, um, you need two-thirds majority, and once that's been achieved, they ask that man, that cardinal, do you accept? And if he says yes, then they ask, by what name do you choose? Now, there's been a custom uh, since the... Uh, but before that, if he does, ex if there was, they come to a conclusion, there's two kinds of smoke. If one that... If they didn't come to the conclusion, and one if they did come, could you tell us that? Yes, every time there's a ballot, and there's two a day, if they don't get two-thirds majority at the first ballot, then they burn the ballots. They put the ballots in a big chalice, then they put them in this little uh, fireplace, and then you can see the chimney. And that's the in chimney. the Sistine Chapel. Yes, yeah. and outside, the people are watching, and if there's black smoke, they put a little few chemicals in there now to make sure. Black smoke means that there was been inclusive, inconclusive uh, election. When someone's been elected two-thirds majority and he accepts, then it's white smoke. So people are outside watching, and so they see it twice a day. Black smoke means it hasn't been elected. Now, if this goes on and on, which doesn't happen that often, but let's say 21 ballots with two a day, and there's not two-thirds majority, then it defaults to simple majority. That's 50% plus one. But in the last um, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it has not had to go that far. And so it's been two-thirds majority. He has to accept. He chooses a name, which he could keep his baptismal name if he wants. But uh, the custom has been since, uh, I believe, around, it was around the, the, the third century that they started changing their names. Uh, Peter obviously kept his own. He can choose a name, keep his own, and then... One of the reason, the well, just to interject, one of the reasons why is because they had, in the beginning, uh, the, the Roman popes had very... A non-Christian. Yeah, I think it was Mercury was yeah. the guy's name. <laughs> so he obviously didn't want to go by Pope Mercury because that was a pagan name. So right. they changed it. So let's say he chooses the name, like say with Pope Francis, okay? He chose the name Francis as his uh, papal name. Which was never chosen before. So he becomes later on Pope Francis, Francis the, the first. first. Okay. And um, like now, John Paul the uh, first, which uh, he was elected right after Pope Paul the sixth. And then John Paul II was elected, and he chose John Paul II because he wanted to con he wanted to have a continuity. And John Paul I wanted continuity with John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth, and that's how he chose that name. Yeah. And then John Paul II, because the reign of John Paul I was so short, he chose that name to continue. So on. you for you uh, trivia buffs, it was Eugenio Pacelli was Pius the Twelfth, then Angelo Roncalli was John the Twenty Third, and then it was. Um, Martini, Gio, uh, yeah, Giovanni Montini was uh, Pope Paul the Sixth, and then we had Albino Luciani, John Paul the First, Carlo Wojtyla, John Paul the Second, and Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, and Jorge Bergoglio, our current uh, reigning Pontiff, Pope Francis. And that means there were fifteen other Benedict Benedicts yes. before uh, uh, 
Pope Benedict XVI. So that's how they get the, yes. the numerology out there. Then he goes to the balcony, and that's when he meets the people for the first time. And There's a room, though, where he... There's a little room because... He, it was, what's it called? He, um, I forget the, the chamber that it's called. Room of Tears. Isn't tears, it? that's right, because <laughs> it's a... In fact, they said when Pope uh, Benedict was elected, he literally cried. Because he, he wanted to retire. He wasn't expecting. <laughs> in fact, if you watch carefully when he goes out in the balcony... You can see he's got his black sweater underneath his, his uh, papal cassock because he had all intention of going back to Germany. And so he wasn't planning because the old Italian saying is, he who enters a conclave of Pope leaves a cardinal, meaning if you think you're going to get it, you're not. But um, the, the room of tears is where you have to go to change because you're wearing the red cardinal um, clothing when you go into the ballot. Then once you accept, you become Pope at that very moment. Because if you're a cardinal, you're already a bishop, and then you become bishop of Rome, you're automatically uh, the pope, even though we had the tradition of, of a papal coronation, now we would call it the papal installation. You're pope at the moment you accept the, uh, the office, if you're already ordained a bishop, you become the, the bishop of Rome. But that room, they have like three or four different generic papal cassocks, throw it on you, uh, put on a stole, you go out and you give your blessing for the first time. They have in, large, in the, small, medium, you know, <laughs> yes. you never know what size you're going to get. Then you so. get a better fit the next day, right. okay? But then he goes out where? He goes onto the balcony there. and it, it's But that balcony is very famous because you probably see it at, at Easter time and at Christmas yeah, it's time. It's only used a few occasions. Now, the Angelus, the Pope does that. That's a side window. He's to be on his papal apartment, yeah, yeah right? So now now this that's the big window when you're looking at St. Peter's right above. And you can see that, and they usually uh, pull out the papal carpet or tapestry, okay, with the the the, the tiara on there. And then the, they decide when they're going to install the pope. Like I said before, it used to be a coronation because they, they used to crown actually him. crown. Right? Yes, he would be anointed. In fact, you go on uh, YouTube, you can see some of the old uh, footage of John Paul, or excuse me, of Pope uh, Pius XII, John the Twenty Third, Pope Paul the Sixth was uh, the last one to be crowned. And then John Paul I uh, decided just to be installed where they put the pallium on him and uh, the, um, the ring Miter. of St. Peter. Now, another thing I, I forgot to mention was when the Pope dies, not only do they wrap his forehead three times, but they take the, the, the seal of, of the fisherman, the ring, and smash it. Okay? Why? Because the ring used to seal and wax papal documents. Uh, not so much now, though, right? Yeah. No, now yeah. they have more But that was the stuff. reason. So to show that that... No more ceiling, you know. Yeah. Now I think they just scratch it because it's kind of hard to to smash the, right. the metal. But if you saw the movie, the shoes of the fisherman, fisherman, yeah, there's a, a beautiful scene where, where that where that takes place. So there's a lot of uh, tradition now. Again, you going back to the older days, um, there were certain things that only the Pope could wear besides the the tiara. Uh, there was a special thing he put over the chasuble, and there were special shoes, and then they had the sedia gestatoria which was the special chair that the Pope sat on, and then they carried him. Um, there was these men, these Italian guys who were, is, were sort of like hereditary. Right, and then they used to do something before that, which goes back to Roman times. Seek. Oh, they seek transit gloria mundi. That was when when Caesar would come in from battle, and for his victory, they would hold that little thing, the, the wreath of all the branches over his head, and guy would be whispering, seek transit gloria mundi. So glows the glory of the world to remind you, yeah, today's a big day, but they'll turn on you, okay? Uh, be careful because the world is fickle. Like one week Jesus is, is hail, Hosanna, the next week we want uh, Barabbas, okay? And for the Pope, it's a reminder that even though he's an earthly ruler too, he's also a spiritual ruler and he should never forget that important role in his life and not let the all the power, whatever, go to his head, in other words. Yeah, like unfortunately it did in some parts of church history with the Medici's and the Borgias, but uh, it's very interesting. And, and um, when you, whenever they don't you use see... That, they don't use the Sadia Gestatoria anymore. No, they use the, they, po they use the Pope Mobile. <laughs> now, it's interesting, too, a little esoteric. We have it in our book, um, um, Pope John Paul II for Dummies. When Pope um, John the Twenty Third was elected... Uh, he was a little hefty guy, and uh, when they oh, yeah. uh, hold him up there, he gave him an inc uh, uh, increase in pay because he said, you're working harder for me than you did for Pius XII because he weighed so much. But uh, like and I said, you know, now they got the Pope Mobile. And now that uh, Pope Francis does not uh, vacation in the summer palace called Castel Gandolfo, that's opened up as a museum. It's about maybe 12 miles south of Rome, and there 
you will find a lot of the things that Father Tregelio was mentioning about in the museum there that you can tour, the Sedia Gestatoria, the different uh, outfits that the popes uh, wore. The gloves, the, gloves the, the, the The special shoes. Even his cars. And then every painting of the pope from the modern era, so that's the roughly around the uh, early 16th century or late 15th century, all the way up to the present pope, you'll see a painting of each. So you can actually... And with the earphones, follow church history. It's, a, it's fascinating uh, to see the papal palace. Plus, you'll go on the third floor where the rooms are, where the pope would stay. And, you know, I mean, for palaces go, it's pretty simple. Yeah. But uh, the idea to be there and to see part of history. And, um, and then also many of these things that were mentioned today, you will see them in this museum. So it's worthwhile for you. And plus, the, in the good weather, to see the papal gardens as well. Oh, so it's worthwhile for you uh, to take a little side trip down to uh, Castel Gandolfo to see this uh, and to really view the history and they have and again the earphones are all in English so it really helps you. Oh, yeah. very nice, very nice. And, and to digest that. And one last little bit of esoterica, you're talking about conclaves. Well, you know, after the popes had been in Avignon, France, for seventy years, uh, Saint Catherine of Siena talked to Pope Gregory and got him to go back to Rome. Well, when he died and they elected another, they're about to elect another, another pope who was going to be urban, they were afraid they were going to vote for a Frenchman because they had been French for 70 years. The Italians pried the ceiling off of the Sistine Chapel and yelled at the cardinals, you better elect an Italian. Hmm. Okay, and that's when they elected urban. Thinking In like 400 that, years, we had only Italian yes. folks, right? So they thought he was, that he was old and feeble. By the time they got back to France, he'd be dead and they'd have another conclave. Well, he perked right up. I mean, so <laughs> that was a big surprise to them. So, but, um, uh, and then um, that really concludes that whole process from death to election of the new Pope to installation. Yes. And, and normally um, Pope oh, I want to talk but... about the Pope's coat of arms, because usually that tells something about the Pope, right? Yes, um, they, they, usually they take the, the coat of arms that he had as a, as a bishop, and, uh, but he can change it completely again, because he's the head of state. Vatican City is an independent sovereign nation, so he is the ruler of of the Vatican. I think, I think John Paul II actually did change it, right, with the M and the he Mary. put an M from yeah. He changed his yeah. personal coat because um, he wanted to show his devotion to the Blessed Mother, whereas Pope Benedict took most of his right. and incorporated. I think um, Pope Francis adjusted half and half. Now, when you have a typical bishop who become you know, when he becomes bishop, he'll have half of the coat of arms is his family or what he's chosen as his uh, heraldry and then the other half is for the diocese the pope because he's a universal uh, head of the whole church he doesn't have you know there's no diocese i mean even though he is the pope, bishop of rome right half of his shield is not the diocese of rome his whole shield is his personal or family coat of arms so um, one of the popes had three uh, honeybees on there right because um, they're the barberini family, family right coat of arms so he can pick that and also, if you'll notice, in recent times, since Pope Benedict, instead of the tiara, there's a miter with three lines on it that is similar to the, the tiara, the, 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 the triregnum, the three-layered crown. But any pope could change that again. Again, another pope could, if he wants to be crowned uh, pope, because, again, this is part of, of tradition. It's not something that says, oh, this is something, you know, um, regalism, because those three crowns, represent, you know, the three levels of the Pope's authority, because he's judge, he's lawmaker, and he's also the, the supreme uh, teacher of the, of the church. And in addition to his, um, uh, the typically Pope's die, we saw just recently with Pope uh, Benedict, they can resign. I mean, it's not that often it happens. And retire. But they can resign and retire. There was only uh, one before that, though, yes. from the 16th century, I think. Yeah. yeah. And th the thing is, Pope Benedict the 16th, a month before he announced his retirement, went to that part of Italy to visit that, yes. that area. Uh -huh. So he must yeah. have been thinking about it. Yeah. But as long as it's freely made, okay, not, that he wasn't coerced like somebody who's put a gun to his head, um, and nobody has accepted. And of course, um, no council, no ecumenical council can depose a pope. Even when we had three claimants to the papacy, the uh, the authentic one resigned, and the other two uh, were cast out because they were not legitimate. So, anyways, I think that was a great question. Okay, so, um, Hillary, thank you. That was one for Father Brigenti. Dear Father Ken, love your church. It looks gorgeous. 
My question is, is it a sin to tell a lie? If it is a sin to tell a lie, then how would you respond to Nazi soldiers who came to your house while you had Jews hiding in your basement? This is signed Consuelo. Well, Consuelo, that's like a classic question, actually, in moral theology, isn't it? <laughs> yes, we get that in the seminary. Yeah, we bit. do. So um, there is something what we call a reserved uh, um, judgment or a conscience. That, uh, in other words, you answer correctly and truthfully, but you evade the specifics. And so uh, the way the question usually is, it says, so if you don't have any Jews in the basement, <laughs> let's say they're in the attic, Yes. And uh and like, there's no Jews in the basement. Like, like um uh, uh what's her name from um uh Amsterdam Fra- uh, Anne Frank Fra- Anne Frank. She was in the attic. Yeah. And uh so you said, Well, yeah, I don't have any Jews in the basement. So you know you're not yeah. you're not lying and you're not committing a lying. You're just not offering any more information than you need or have to. So even though you have Jews in the house, they're in the um in the attic, you didn't lie. So it's called reserve judgment. Mental, mental Me- reservation. Mental reservation, that's it. Or sometimes called equivocation. Where you so you're say, really not lying. No, it's not lying because but you're not, you don't it have is to, wrong to lie. And they're not entitled because they are oppressors and uh, killers and murderers. They're not entitled to the whole piece of knowledge either. That's right. They're not entitled to all the facts. Now, interesting, Pope uh, John Paul had adjusted the catechism slightly because previously it had been defined that a lie was... Um, uh, was withholding the truth from someone who was um, entitled to it. And then they tweaked that to say, no, um, a lie is withholding uh, ev- or withholding the truth from someone who asks it, but not everyone's entitled to know all the facts. Okay, so you can be use mental reservation and say, I don't see any Jews here, meaning in front of you. Right. They're in the basement, they're in the attic, you're just making a true statement. I don't see them here. And so, and again, people might say, well, that's legalism. No, because the Nazis are not entitled to know exactly where the Jews are because they mean nothing but bad to do to them. Right. Anyways, thank you, Consuelo. Great question and very uh, astute. So uh, now we have one for you, Father. Okay. And um, dear Father John, if the civil law says a priest must report sex abusers who confess his crimes, what should he do? Francine. Mm, Francine, that's a, I'm glad you asked. I mean, it's, it's sad you have to ask, it, but, but it's a good question. First and foremost, the priest must never divulge the seal of confession, the secrets of the confessional, because we make a solemn oath when we are ordained. Okay, uh, we're going to take this to death. And not even the Pope can make us divulge who went to confession or what they confessed. Now, that being the case, that's here's a good reason for uh, confession anonymously, because no DA is going to want to put a priest on the witness stand if you heard somebody say something behind a curtain and you couldn't see their face, because not everybody recognizes voices, and that sometimes is is uh, obfuscated by the material, and especially if it's in a booth. So the fact that there are face-to-face confessions led some DAs to say, well, like in Australia, I think in California they wanted to pass this law, that let's say a sex abuser comes in and confesses, they want you to blab. Well, you can't. It's sacrosanct. It's even more sacred than the doctor-patient or the attorney-client relationship. But that doesn't mean they're not going to try to put a priest on the stand. All you could say is nothing. You can't say yes. You can't say no. You just have to sit there and maybe um, be in contempt of court. You might go to jail. You might even have to die. I think there was a famous case in the 1950s of that, wasn't there? That And that's where uh, religious uh, freedom of religion came in. Uh, and the priest did actually go to, to jail yes. because he would not divulge. It was a Baltimore priest, I think it was. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and it was in the 1950s. And he uh, would not divulge what was in the confession. He actually ended up in prison. But le- then subsequently, he was released, and the law was changed to respect that. Well, it's being challenged again. It was, of all places, Louisiana, which is a very Catholic state, uh, was challenged there, and California most recently. Uh, But both uh, times, they were, uh, uh, the legislature uh, did not uh, go through with it. But I really do think, as you say, Father John, it is the... Uh, the I think the the uh, impetus to make our confessionals once again with no option, but rather just behind the screen, it protects the celebrant and it protects the penitent, 
Because remember, a priest can go hear a mafioso confession, yeah. and the mafioso can go and, and, and confess his sins or her sins without the fear that that priest is going to divulge of that, of that, um, that sin and then receive absolution, yeah. okay, which uh, cleanses of the person's sins based on the fact that you know, they have to have a true conversion of heart. Uh, and uh, and truly penitent and sorry for their for their sins, uh, but still that that idea of that you can go and receive this this great sacrament to heal and cleanse uh, is so important, uh, and um, and so it's worth literally dying for. Oh you yeah, know? because you know, the priest himself, if he divulges that confession, he is excommunicated automatically. And even if the excommunication is lifted, it probably will never be. Uh, put back into active no, service. No, and that's reserved to the to the Pope Holy himself. Holy See, yeah. Only the Pope can absolve it. Now, my, someone might think, well, what's the problem if this is a sex abuser or a terrorist and aren't, isn't the higher good to save more people? We have to remember that the salvation of souls, this is the last canon of, of the code of the canon law, the salvation of souls is the supreme law of the church. Therefore, Saving the person's soul is, is more important than what potential harm may come because this is what we call internal forum. Now, there's nobody on earth who would want uh, an attorney to be able to be forced to say what their client said, and we respect the privacy of a doctor and a patient. Well, all the more so for a priest, a confessor, and the penitent. So even if the guy goes in and says, you know, I'm going to kill a priest today, the priest can't say, well, i got to turn him in. I, or I got to make an well, anonymous tip. Here's another one of those moral um, uh, uh, hypothesis questions. <laughs> hypothetical. So, yeah. uh, so let, 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 uh, hypothetical, I should say. Yeah. So let's say uh, a, a a person comes into confession, right, and says, "Father, I put poison in uh, one of the cruets for mass." Yeah, that that's when we always heard. If there, it's that never always happened, hard, yeah. but if it were to happen, God forbid, the priest can't do anything. Because he he's not allowed to take... What you heard on the inside, you cannot act on the outside. Now, that that's... So you can't just say to the altar server, uh, dump that out, I don't think there's something... I mean, there's a bug in there or something. First, that would be a lie. And two, you're using information you heard. It's never happened, though. It's hypothetical. You know, it's like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? How many, Father? Uh, there's <laughs> numerous because they don't take up space. Oh, okay. Ah, so you think, like, I knew that one. <laughs> Well, it's Monday morning uh, or Monday afternoon that yes. we're taping this. So, but you'll. Uh, but um, anyways, good question, uh, Francine, and um, we're probably going to see more challenges like this yep. in the future uh, as our world becomes darker and darker to uh, the, uh, to to the church, and 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 the, and we'll see more persecution. Cardinal George, God rest his soul. Uh, said that uh, well, he was Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, and he says probably not too far from the future that we might see martyrs again dying for the faith in this country, meaning in the United States, because uh, of the way uh, our religious freedom and liberties are being challenged and being attacked. So uh, we're probably going to see more of these cases. Absolutely. Again, a good reason to go back to the traditional confessional, mm -hmm. uh, I think. All right. Um, we might have a short question for you. Okay, uh, I'm ready. Uh, okay. How many times can we receive Holy Communion on the same day once the virus goes away? Frank from Flemington. Two. That's it, the limit, two. Canon 917, you receive Communion twice on the same day, and you must receive it uh, this, at least the second time at a, at a Mass. Okay, now, if you're dying, you receive Viaticum, you can receive that uh, more than once, but... Normally, if you go to Mass twice a day, you can receive communion. If you go three times to Mass, still only twice, okay? Prior to that, it had to be an exceptional occasion like a wedding or a, a funeral or a priest's first Mass. But now, there's no distinction. Two is the limit uh, per day. That's it. Well, thank you, and thank you for receiving us into your living room or wherever you're viewing us. Uh, we Even come to, in Canada. We come to a conclusion of another great uh, episode. We'd like to thank Father Matthew Marinelli, who's our producer, editor, sound man, director. Uh, director. Uh, he's the one that does all the special effects that you probably enjoy. Uh, and uh, so stay tuned again tomorrow. Uh, we will be taping another great show. We'll be answering your questions 
If you're interested in sending a question or if you always wanted to have a, a religious question answered, this is a great time to do so. And you can, they will be putting up an email address where you can direct your questions to. Again, uh, over the weekend, quite a few came in, so we're really looking forward to answering you, the viewers, questions. Also, thank you for your generosity and continuing to support our parish uh, for contributions uh, are very important to keep things going here. Uh, so if you either send it in by mail or you drop them off personally in the church or you sign up to electronic giving or PayPal or texting, however you do it, we thank you very much for uh, continuing your generosity. And Father, why don't we give them our blessing now as we conclude another episode? Okay. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Father the Son, Son, and the Holy, Holy spirit. spirit. Amen. Amen. And God bless you until we see you next time. Bye-bye. Rejoice. Alleluia. Alleluia. Come on. For he whom thou didst bear. Alleluia. As he said